Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and this video is Don't Use Apache Airflow, which might surprise you because you've probably heard a lot of good things about Apache Airflow, but I'll explain. And please consider joining my inner circle on Patreon and among the benefits, getting to watch videos like this without ads, but also getting direct access to me and helping support me in my mission to upskill people around the world. Let's jump in. So where are we going? Well, we'll start by talking about what is Airflow. There's a lot of confusion around that. We'll talk about Airflow's identity crisis, its limitations, and what Airflow is good for, and some better options for ETL and data movement. So this, it's a bit grainy here, but this is what I found on like a Wikipedia description of what Airflow is. And it talks about Airflow is an open source workflow management platform for data engineering pipelines. And it was created originally by Airbnb, hence the air in the name. I'm going to cross out data engineering because actually this has nothing to do with data engineering at all. It's just any kind of jobs you want to run, it'll run them and you can declare dependencies, etc. So I want to just say it's a job scheduler. It makes it a lot easier. Doesn't sound as cool because in some ways it's not that glamorous. And um, it's only called Airflow because of Airbnb and the fact that it has flows, right? It has workflows. And it all started on a directed acyclic graph. What does that mean? It starts with something like a, an object, say A, and A has relationship to other objects like B and C. And those have dependencies or relationships to other objects like B to D and C to E and F. Now this actually could be among other things, this could be a job schedule, right? We want to run task A, and that has to happen before B or C can kick off. But there's no dependencies between B and C, so they can run concurrently. After B executes, D can execute, but only after B executes. And E and F can execute after C executes, and they are not dependent on each other either. So you can see this kind of flow. Each circle is called a vertice, and each line between them are called edges. So you have the object and the relationship represented by an edge or line. They're directional in that you can see the arrows, right? They go one way. They do not loop. One of the rules of directed acyclic, meaning no cycles, no looping graphs, is that they don't loop back. So if you try to point B back to A, and then A is still pointing to B, then you have a problem because basically either one is waiting for the other to run first. And to avoid these kind of traps, it doesn't allow you to do that. Let's take a look at an example of this with social media. Because you see this a lot with graph APIs where we can do visuals representing things like social media or physical locations. In this case, we can see that Mike has relationships, say, on some social media with Sally and Matt. And Sally has a relationship with Lisa. Matt has a relationship with Bob and Sue. And so you can see Mike is connected to Sally and Matt, Sally's connected to Lisa, etc., and Matt is connected to Bob and Sue. So what are some applications for DAGs? Well, Apache Spark is built on them. When you look at the engine and how it supports distributing the work, and especially when it gets into how it's going to optimize what's going to happen under the covers, it uses DAG. Python Dask also uses DAGs to figure out how to schedule its work and create the dependencies. And as I mentioned, graph analysis APIs often use DAGs. Machine learning uses DAGs also because when you get into certain types of machine learning, we have tree structures. That's often really represented well in DAGs. And as I mentioned, Apache Airflow is yet another application of using DAGs. And here comes the identity crisis. It's heavily promoted as an ETL service. A lot of people have reached out to me and said, Brian, are you going to do something on Airflow? Isn't it a great ETL tool? Should we use Airflow to do our data movement? It's heavily promoted that way, but actually it has no relationship whatsoever to really any kind of data movement or ETL. It's cron on steroids. That's the easiest way to remember it. It can be used for any scheduled work, and I think it's really best designed as an underlying service or best used as an underlying service. What do I mean? Well, say you were trying to build something like your own Apache Spark, or you wanted to create something like SQLite spread out over clusters and executing in parallel. And you didn't want to have to do all of that dependency management and all the work that goes into it. You wanted to be able to leverage a tool under the covers that could do that for you. Then perhaps using something like Airflow would be a good use case. To some extent, I do think Apache Airflow is a bit like a solution looking for a problem. 
want to go a little more into what Airflow is again, which is it's a job scheduler. It's a sophisticated job scheduler and it uses DAG, which are really cool and trendy now, right? In the end though, it is a framework written in Python and only for Python. And that's important to remember too. It's not for any of the languages. So let's talk about the limitations. It does not have any ETL functionality. So if you're expecting to get any help moving data into databases or out or writing to files, you're not getting it. It requires 100% coding. So in a day and age where you keep saying things about low code and no code, here is all code, which is a lot of maintenance work. It only supports Python and it is an extremely complex framework with a steep learning curve. This is not something you're going to learn during the lunch break and jump in productive. It's going to take some time to learn how to leverage it. It requires its own code base and DevOps. This is something in the documentation I was reading as I'm learning about it and they talk about that like yeah this is more code. You could theoretically have more airflow code creating and defining your DAGs then you actually have code that is running to do things. So I think that's a, something to consider. You're taking on a lot of overhead, a lot of work just to get job execution. It also has very strong coupling between the job scheduler and the app code. And I'm going to show you an example of that with Python, which I have some concerns with because if you have some really nice functions, classes, etc., and they can be used in many different ways. If you start to put code in them that is specific to Airflow, then you're limiting where it can be used. Okay, Brian, so you don't really like Airflow so much. So what should I use for ETL or ELT? Well, actually Apache NiFi looks really good. I think I'm going to do a video on that as well, maybe a few. NiFi looks really cool. It's no code, right? You just drag and drop, create components. It reminds me a lot of some database tools I've used like SQL Server Integration Services, and I've seen a lot of other ones. And Pentaho has something similar too. So NiFi is good. That's a good option to look at. If you're in a cloud environment, you have options like AWS Glue or Azure Data Factory or GCP Dataproc. Now I know Azure Data Factory is becoming the de facto standard on Azure to move data around and schedule work like that. And it's already in Azure and obviously it's going to do a good job of integrating things in Azure. Kettle by Pentaho is an open source tool you can also use. ETL tool that has a GUI. And if using Databricks and if using Spark on the cloud environments I can't think of really good reasons why you wouldn't be using Databricks in most cases. Then use Databricks jobs and notebooks. Databricks is doing a lot of work around Delta Lake. And if you look at what they're doing, it's very clear that they're building in a lot of seamless integration, seamless ETL work to take raw data from bronze, silver, gold, as they call it, so that you're getting the whole staging process through cleaning it up and making it ready for production use. So you don't want to throw that away. I would say stick with that and work through it because I think Databricks is going to keep making this better. So you don't like Airflow, Brian? Is it good for anything? Yeah, yeah, I think it is good for something. So let me talk about that. It's good at drawing DAGs, which seems kind of strange, but there's a lot of talk in the documentation about doing that. So if you want to draw DAGs, it's a good tool for that. But taking those DAGs to define really complex computations may make sense in some cases. If you are launching a spaceship to the moon or to go into space that's pretty complex and lives are at stake it needs to be right it needs to function correctly you need to know every piece and option is working correctly and this is where I think airflow is really good it's got great logging it has very you can visually look at things you can see what went wrong where you can rerun pieces of jobs or entire jobs so it is really good for that kind of thing when you have that kind of critical need and complexity and you want it all to be self-contained. You actually want the sort of commingled Airflow code with your Python ETL code, then again, it's good. And again, you're getting back to that complex computations. You need meticulous control. You want every little dot and slash and period completely watched and monitored. And by the way, did you notice I made this a DAG? So let me talk a little about the Airflow code. Let's start at how it actually looks if you were going to create your own job known as a DAG. Starts here with the function DAG. So we're using a context manager in this case and it says with DAG and then it defines all kinds of parameters to the DAG function as DAG and of course this would have to be imported. You have the name tutorial and default arguments being assigned. It's given a short description. It's given a schedule interview. That's how actually you schedule things. You say how many, how often should this run and then you give it a start date and that's how it will execute. And that's pretty flexible, hourly, you know, daily, etc. It has a catch-up parameter here we're setting to false. We've got tags, we're setting some tags. 
that defines just a, a stub basically it says we've got a job we have doesn't do anything we haven't defined any task but we have a job and now we create a very simple I mean as simple as you could possibly get away with simple job with the two tasks t1 and t2 and they use a thing called a bash operator now operators in airflow are types of tasks you can do so they're kind of like an outer function that defines what you're going to do so the bash operator is used to execute bash commands and the Python operator is used to execute Python commands so here we see a bash operator the DAG has to have an ID which we see above and the tasks all have to have a unique ID so here we have an ID of print date and then we just have our bash command which is to execute date the t2 has a task ID of sleep and it has its parameters depends on past faults bash command and sleep 5 that's what's going to execute and it has a retries equal 3 parameter set so these are our tasks between the two of them we have what we need now to create an extremely simple bare bones job the final thing we do is we define the dependencies so here is one way to do that where we say task 1 to run and then use the shift operator so the greater than greater than sign and the next task and we could have greater than greater than or shift operator another task another task this is creating our task dependencies when we're all said and done with this this is what we have we have our DAG print date related to sleep print date comes first followed by sleep and we could see this in the UI that Airflow provides let's take another example this time using Python of creating a DAG which is more realistic it gives you a better feel for how Airflow would work with Python. In this case, instead of doing the DAG function, etc., we're going to use Python decorators. So we're using a function decorator here at DAG, defining it above a function called ETL. This defines our job. So the ETL is going to define our entire job. It will contain all those functions. We have our schedule interval. We have our start date. We have our DAG run timeout. Right. These are our parameters, and we could have any number of other parameters, but we're taking defaults at this point. So we have our decorator, and now we have our outer function. Within this function, our DAG is defined here. We're going to have our first task, and we use the at task decorator, or the task decorator, and here's our first function. So this runs all the way down to here. So all this is task one. And what it's doing is, this is an example on their website, it's going to go get some data out on the internet and bring it in, write it to a file. And the second task, again, another decorator, here, merge data is going to take the data that was written out and load it into a Postgres table. So those are the two functions. This line, as we saw in the last example as well, is defining the relationship. Get data first, followed by merge data. And they must happen and be successful in that order. So if get data fails, merge data will not run. And finally, we define our DAG pointing back to the ETL function. Not really sure why the decorator didn't already kind of do that, but apparently you have to do it again. So we have our lowercase DAG we created at the top and we're assigning it to the ETL function which is the higher level function which is right here so this ETL basically consists of the functions we're going to be executing Now, having said that let me show you a few things I'm not too wild about it looks in many ways like Django which also uses a lot of decorators to do things but in that case it makes a lot of sense because you're tying it all into a web app so here's our first piece this is specific to Airflow and means that this code really can't be used outside of Airflow in the way it's defined here because it's all one script, right? It's all one giant script. We have our ETL here. And again, we're co-mingling. The at task decorate is great, but it's defining this task. It's extending these functions to work with Airflow, which means, again, they're not really usable anywhere else. So if these were pretty generic functions that we could use in many places, we'd have to make sure we extract them out and not commingle code like this and then of course this is also specific code for airflow so wrapping up what is airflow we talked about what airflow is and two things i really want you to take away is one is it is a very sophisticated job scheduler and that's really it but the other piece you could keep in mind is it creates dags and its entire workflow engine is built around dags which is again a directed acyclic graph. I also talked about Airflow's identity crisis, that it's really mismarketed and often misidentified 
as many things are these days in the open source community, things are just thrown out there. Use this, use this. And oftentimes, you know, you're just getting the wrong solution for a problem. I talked about limitations, and I think there are a lot here. And don't forget, this is completely a Python library, so you're restricted to Python only, which isn't bad if you're doing only Python. But I talked about a lot of other limitations as well, namely that it commingles a lot of code, it's very complex, it's, and it's a lot of complexity to learn and get executing. And the question really becomes, is it worth it? Do you really need this, or are there better solutions that you can use? I did talk about cases where I think Airflow is good and when it makes sense. And it comes down to when it really is making use of its strengths, which is the ability to support very complex relationships between tasks at a very micro level, as much as you need, and to be able to monitor and enforce those reliably with lots of logging and visuals. It's very transparent that way, so that's good. But I also talked about better options, and I think NiFi is a good option. I talked to ben about Pentaho Kettle, or things like Azure Data Factory, and things that are native to the cloud environments. So that's it for this video. I want to thank you, and again, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I appreciate all the support, and I'd love to have you as part of my inner community. Please like, share, subscribe, and until next time, I'm Pullin' for you. We're all in this together.